Michael Corrin spent the past few decades on television, radio, and in print engaging on the issues of the day as one of Canada's most high-profile social conservatives. Until recently, his newest book, Epiphany, A Christian's Change of Heart and Mind Over Same-Sex Marriage, reveals a new Michael Corrin. And he joins us now. It's great to have you back here at TVO. Pleasure, thank you. Let me just do an excerpt from your book to get us started here. You write, I believe that the welcoming of gay people who have suffered at Christian hands for so long is at the epicenter of the modern Christian challenge, and that by washing away the stains of prejudice and discrimination, we can spark a new awakening. That's a fascinating thing for you to have written, because I think a lot of people <laughs> would not imagine that you would be writing such things, given what you've written in the past. Can you tell us whether there was a moment? I mean, the book's called Epiphany. Mm -hmm. Did you actually have a moment of epiphany when you thought, everything I've thought about this in the past is wrong? It was an overnight change, but there were dozens of overnight changes. Uh, it, it's a very good question. I can't really give it a, a good answer because th there, there were moments that seemed incredibly profound and revolutionary to me, but when I think back on them, there, were, there was packaging around them. I mean, there, there were various incidents in my life, and, and it was an evolving, and there were all sorts of factors. There were personal ones. Um, my age, around 57 now, I've reached a certain point in my life where I suppose ambition is no longer an issue and I can see the end rather than the beginning and there are other parts of my life that I, that I would want to explore. There were incidents internationally beyond me, what was going on in Uganda with uh, it's a deeply homophobic culture, more so than anywhere else in Africa and what was happening to gay people there. World vision. And the, and the initial embracing of gay couples and having to reverse that position under pressure. And um, so, no, there wasn't an epiphany. There was something, though, that was occurring about, about three years ago. I was very conscious of it. I was increasingly uncomfortable in my Christian faith. And it, it's been there since the early 80s. I mean, I became a Christian, and I, I really have never wavered. But the, the Jesus that I was supposed to worship and revere and listen to Seemed, was all about love and justice and forgiveness and inclusion and tolerance. And I realized that I was about, more than that, I was about judgment. Now, not hatred. I mean, I, really, I did not hate. I understand mm -hmm. I probably did enable hatred, and I said some dumb and flippant things, and I've apologized so many times. Um, but it wasn't love. It wasn't inclusion. And I felt myself increasingly at a distance from the God I claimed to worship. Mm -hmm. And that was breaking me apart. What I just quoted, you wrote this year. Mm. What I'm about to quote, you wrote four years ago. Far too much time has been devoted to the bullying of gay kids, largely because the gay community seems to have an emotional hold over our culture and politicians right now. Urban North America has become extremely gay friendly in recent years, to the point where in some schools it is even a fashion statement to come out and silly girls regard having a gay friend as the ultimate fashion accessory. Teachers rush to the defense, even the affirmation of gay kids and homosexuality. Gay teachers often push an agenda, and students who, from a Christian or Muslim perspective, have any sort of objections to the homosexual lifestyle are made to feel eccentric, if not evil. A bit of a touchy-feely question, but how do you feel about <laughs> yourself having written that just four years ago? Some of that's true. I mean, there are silly girls who, and it's a very patronizing thing, having a gay male friend is a fashion statement, and that's deeply offensive, but I see it from a different point of view now. And so there are, there are elements in that I would still stand by, but no, if, look, I can quote you worse than that. I mean, th th there are lots of things I've said and done over the years, and again, that, that's a very good example, because it's not hateful as such, but I don't think it's... It's, it's a bit mocking. Yes, and it's insufficiently empathetic, and mm -hmm. it's not very Christian either. Mm -hmm. And while people have to have the, the right to speak out against various issues and not face discrimination, I, I don't think I was feeling for other people. I, I, I hadn't spent enough time with... Look, thank, thank God, North America, outside of churches, has become far more gay-friendly. And we may see the situation one day where almost every institution in North America is, 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 believes in gay equality, apart from churches. I mean, the, the army believes in it, but not the churches. Hmm. But th that's a good example of me. Uh, there's a bit of pride. Uh, there's speaking instead of listening. There's no empathy. Um, that n there's not that leap that I thought I was capable of, uh, of, of faith. I'm and not sure you can be a good newspaper columnist, though, if you're not provocatively jerkish 
from time to time, I right? I suppose so. I mean, I'm, 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 I don't have a weekly column anymore, and that's been rather liberating, too, because I, th I think sometimes you do write in, in a certain mode. But no, look, see, that, and I can I'm show you dozens of other examples, that I got it completely mm. wrong, and, and, yet, and I'm sorry for it. And yet, on this issue, I think you told us in the book, th this was never a big animating issue for you anyway, right? No, and, and that's something, again, which I should be even more ashamed of, really, because it wasn't. And, I mean, I've never been homophobic. And because people oppose equal marriage doesn't mean they're homophobic. Many are, perhaps even most, but it doesn't mean you have to be. But I, I was raised in the UK from a working-class home, and I was, went, went to various universities, where a lot of my influences were gay men in particular, who were very good to me, um, n never came on to me. I'm way too ugly, probably. But, I mean, they, it wasn't that. It was, they, they were very supportive and helpful and kind. And, and I was ungrateful, I suppose, in many ways. And it, it wasn't an issue for me. But I became this poster boy for conservative Catholicism, particularly after I wrote a book about the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. and, and this was part of the package. And so I became identified with. Uh, and I should have said no, but I didn't. I said yes, there's no one to blame apart from me. And now you say that, quote unquote, this issue is at the epicenter of the modern Christian challenge. The yeah. epicenter? I, come? In North America, I, th I think it is. I think it is. Because, uh, as I, I referred to earlier, we will face a situation, to, and to, to a degree we have it now, where the institution that is meant to be the most loving in the world is the only one that stands against full equality for gay people. If we can change this, and I, I don't want this to sound like hyperbole, but if we can change teaching around the gay issue, it'll show that Christians don't have a literal interpretation of scripture, and it's not meant to be interpreted on a literal basis. We have to use metaphor and understanding. That we can also then judge other aspects of life through that, uh, um, not liberal, but more intelligent interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it'll show that Christians and churches can learn and adapt. I, I've, I've used a phrase recently, the fifth gospel, the gospel of experience. I, 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 believe, I believe in the creed. I mean, my, my faith is stronger than ever, deeper than ever. This is a product of my faith. It's not in spite of it, it's because of it. But if we can now show that experience also changes us as Christians, we can become relevant and pertinent to a lot of people who right now are saying, you just don't matter anymore. So do you think the day is coming in your lifetime or mine where the Catholic Church will marry two gay people? No. I mean, I remember I left the Catholic Church. How about the two Anglican years ago. Church? Uh, well, the Ang Anglican Church in the United States does, the Episcopal Church does. The Anglican Church in Canada uh, doesn't. It does accept openly gay clergy, and there's a lot of discussion about the issue, but it won't marry same sex couples. In our life, the Roman Catholic Church, it's going to be very difficult because it's based on a natural law understanding of theology. And marriage is about procreation. That's not all of it, but a large part of it. I, I, I can't see, even under this pope, uh, the Catholic Church adapting on this issue or female ordination, maybe married clergy, but that's about as far as they will go, and that'll be a tough one. Another quote from the book. I'm not really sure if the Bible openly and explicitly supports same-sex love and equal marriage, but I think there's a good argument to say, you tell us, that it does and an even better argument to say that it doesn't really have an opinion on the subject that applies to the modern world. I am more convinced, you write, however, that it doesn't condemn it and that we've got this one wrong for far too long. Mm. Well, we'll just amplify on that somewhat. Yeah, this is an important point because we don't want to claim too much. Anyone who says the Bible says equal marriage is fine, it's wonderful, that, that, that isn't true. Mm -hmm. There are only about half a dozen references to homosexuality in the Bible, which is a big book. It's bigger than my book. I mean, it's a big book. If someone came from another world, they would say, oh, the Bible, that's all about gay people, isn't it? I mean, it, it really doesn't mention them very often. The Old Testament never mentions lesbianism. Jesus never mentions homosexuality. And I understand you don't have to mention everything. It can still be an issue. But he does talk about divorce, for example, and lots of other issues. He's very tough on divorce. He is. He's I... way tougher on divorce than homosexuality. Well, of course he is. I'm, I'm, I'm not here to condemn divorce, but I do find it pretty rich when people have been divorced once, twice, or three times get very angry about homosexuality because maybe they're misreading Scripture. Uh, but it, the essence of the New Testament is love. The, the quintessence of the life of Jesus is love and acceptance and inclusion. Now, I, I've, there's a whole chapter about Scripture, and there are passages that I think actually are very gay-friendly, including the life of Jesus and a, a, a centurion. But even beyond that, if you don't accept that, it's not an issue of Scripture. It, the ambiguity is the keynote. And it, ambiguity should lead us to be indifferent. I don't believe that Christian churches um, should automatically change overnight. I think they should begin to just dismantle their opposition. It's not a level playing field. If someone goes into a church and, and, and says, I, um, I'm not sure about gay marriage, or I believe in gay marriage, or I'm gay, 
they can still lose their job at a college, they can be uh, denied confirmation or communion, uh, they can be uh, far from a teaching position at a school, all sorts of things are still going on. So it's not a level playing field. I'm quite prepared, people who oppose same-sex marriage, of course should be accepted into a church. But what's happening now is people who are for same-sex marriage are being told, in most churches, you don't belong. Let's just go a little deeper into the biblical scripture and see what is there and what mm. is not there, because there's certainly the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yep. One always concludes, and I guess we get the word sodomy from there, right? That this place was destroyed by God mm. because there was too much uh, homosexuality going on. You don't interpret it that way? No, I, I wouldn't claim to be a, a theologian. Uh, but I, I'm not as tall as the great theologians, but I can stand on their shoulders. <laughs> and a modern theology, no, it doesn't believe this at all. Elsewhere in Scripture, there are references to Sodom. Gomorrah seems to be rather forgotten, poor place. But there are references to Sodom that don't refer to sexuality or homosexuality at all. It's about lack of charity and animalistic behavior, rejecting the stranger, the refugee, the, the migrant. It's not about this issue. It was only in, in medieval Europe that one particular writer tried to emphasize the, the, the homosexual aspect of it. So I don't think that one stands up to any scrutiny okay, at let me all. Give you, let me give you another one. Leviticus calls homosexuality an abomination, detestable, mm. punishable by death. How is that ambiguous? Uh, look at what else it also says is really bad and you could die for all sorts of things. And the whole list of uh, uh, kosher food, or mixing certain materials in what you wear. And what is, what is this just really about? Is it about same-sex love, or is it about the use of a person for sexual gratification? Because a, a lot of what is written here, and there isn't very much, is about using boys, using young boys as you would use a young girl just for your own satisfaction. It's not about two men or two women committing themselves to each other in a loving relationship. I'm not done yet, Michael. Let's do another <laughs> one. Here we go. Matthew 19, verse 3 to 5. Some Pharisees approached him and tested him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause whatever? He said, Jesus in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? Mm -hmm. Again, how do you not interpret that as Jesus saying marriage is between a man and a woman? I don't think it's about uh, gender in marriage. I think it's about the sanctity of marriage. I think that's a problematic one for those people who say divorce is acceptable. Now, I mean, I, I think also modern understanding of divorce, uh, it is acceptable. But that is really about... Also, there's context here. This is a culture where women were thought to be usable and disposable. Um, I know people are very critical of Islam today and, and, and gender relationships, but in ancient Judaism, it was very easy for a man to divorce his wife. Very, very easy, and even easier for, for pagan cultures. This is Jesus saying, no, marriage is more important than that. Marriage is more important than that. He's using the words of, of, of heterosexual marriage, but I don't think that's exclusive. Do you think th there were gay people uh, in the Bible? Oh, yeah, of course. Can you give us an example? Well. Look, I'm not trying to offend people here, but David and Jonathan is a bit tricky. You know, love for you more than that, for a man for a woman. I mean, this is a very close relationship. There are always gay people. Ancient culture, homosexuality was probably more accepted than, than in, in modern society, or at least until about 30 or 40 years ago. Greek and Roman culture, um, it, it was certainly accepted. Yes, that there are, which is why his, his lack of reference to it in the Gospels is actually e extremely significant, because it's not as though there may be someone who is gay somewhere. It was very well known. In fact, the, the occupied Judeans, those in Judea and Galilee of the time, would mock the Romans. They didn't have the word gay or homosexual, but uh, as being like that. I mean, yes, they were very aware of it, many people. If there are all these references, which with added study, you have now come to the conclusion... There aren't many references, though. That's, you, you, that's, you've almost exhausted it there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, okay, why did, I guess, why did it take you so long to come around to this view that you have now and hold on to the views that you held for so long? Because I'm a stubborn idiot, I suppose. You know what, Steve, because you get embedded in, in a culture and a spasm. And I, I'm not a stupid person, but you react in a certain way and... Uh, Look, it, it, I don't want to sound too pious, but there is something supernatural. When you realize, it, it's like suddenly you have the glasses work, you can see things clearly, and you think, my golly, why didn't I see that before? But I didn't see it before. You needed more time. It sounds like a lame excuse, maybe more time. Mm -hmm. um, I was also, I was, when I called for Christians to rally around opposition to Uganda's consideration of a new law that would effectively say, if you're gay, we can kill you. 
And it wasn't quite that, but effectively it would say you can be executed for being homosexual. When I said, let's rally around this, we can still oppose equal marriage, or same-sex marriage we'd call it then, but let's stand up for this genocidal attitude. When I was attacked for that, when I was accused of things and of betraying my faith, I realized, Mike, you might be in the wrong place. When I, I wrote a column a couple of years ago, apologize. I didn't even mention marriage. I just apologized at any pain I'd caused to the gay community and so on. And I'm still at Sun News at the time. And, and it was like the gates of hell, honestly, had, had just been opened. And the attacks on me and my family, and I was an adulterer, and my, and, and my wife was gay, and the kids were Everyone was gay or having an affair. I mean, it was, or, or I was being blackmailed by my gay lover. I've never found the poor guy, but apparently this, or I'd had a breakdown. When all that hatred is thrown at you, you're forced to say, I may have been wrong. Uh, I'm not arguing that everyone is like this in the, the conservative Christian world, but if so many are, that's not me, and that's not Jesus, and that's not what I want to be. Hmm. Let me modernize the references somewhat here. We'll hmm. go two or 3,000 years into the future, meaning right now. <laughs> this is from the Pew Research Center, uh, and it's about changing attitudes on gay marriage. Sheldon, let's bring these uh, numbers up if we can here. Uh, the percentage of Americans who favor same-sex marriage, 55% now, opposed 39%. As you break it down into demographics, among millennials, 70% support, Gen Xers, 59%, baby boomers, 45%, the silent generation, 39%. How about in terms of their religious observance? Those unaffiliated, 82% support marriage equality. White mainline Protestants, even the majority there, 62%. Catholics, 57%. Here's where the numbers fall. Black Protestants, 34%. White Evangelicals, only a quarter. These numbers do suggest that your side basically has won this debate, your new side, if I can put it that way. Is that right? The secular argument is pretty much done and uh, in, in North America and Europe, not in Russia, in Africa, in the West Indies, in large parts of Asia. It's, not, it's hardly even started. But it's the Christian world. Uh, the evangelical world is certainly still very much opposed. The Catholic world generally reflects the secular world, because a lot of people who call themselves Catholic aren't really Catholic anymore. Uh, mainline Protestant, which would be Episcopal and so on, United Methodist, yes, they're, they're coming around too. Um, but the, the Catholic response to this is not the response of the Catholic Church, it's of Catholic people. The Catholic Church still refers to disorder and, and sin, and there's been no evidence of any change at all. And the Pope may have made a couple of comments, gestures, but they're not in any way meaningful, and the Catechism hasn't been changed in the last document that came well, out of Rome. Well, what do you mean they're not meaningful? Well, for, meaningful. well, for example, and I talk about this in the book, when he said on a plane, who am I to judge? No. He wasn't talking about homosexuality. He was talking about one man who had had a gay relationship who'd left it behind to be a celibate priest. The, the inference that the world drew from that was much more significant yes, than that. Yes, it was, but I, I would argue incorrectly, because he goes on to speak about conspiracies, Masonic conspiracies, and the problem is gay people organizing and working in conspiracies. He went to the Philippines. And, he, and gender theory, which is really a Catholic shorthand for same-sex marriage and so on, he said those who were promoting uh, gender theory, he compared them to the Hitler Youth. Hmm. So I mean, whilst like, the Pope has been wonderful on many issues, the last document didn't even open the door. It turned the handle slightly on divorce. Other than that, it did nothing at hmm. all. What do you infer from this? The United Church has one of the best track records on supporting gay rights. They have hmm. openly gay ministers. They perform gay marriages. Yep. They have had two openly gay heads of the church. And their membership is apparently, have I got this right, one of the fastest declining in North America, there in, no, or in Canadian churches to be sure. Yeah. Is there a connection there, do you think? No, I don't think there's a connection. I mean, that's absolutely true. I think it's a, a coincidence, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, there are, the United Church is, is a Protestant denomination that has all sorts of inner struggles. And, and I've got to know it quite well in the past year, year and a half, and there's some wonderful people there, but it's not my theology. Uh, other churches that are more progressive, Look, the evangelical church, there are, there are many progressive evangelicals, people like Steve Chalk in the UK and, and Tony Campolo in the US have come out publicly in favor of equal marriage. And, and the number, their supporters, the huge numbers of people. Mm. So I think we've got to be careful to, to link um, a certain type of liberal Christianity and those people who support it. There are many, many liberal Christians out there, people who reject a strict Catholic or strict evangelical approach they often find that the churches they go to are not preaching um, an orthodox Christianity, 
Ortho I'm an orthodox, small orthodox Christian. I believe in the creed. I, be I mean, and I'm crazy on this. I, be I believe in the miracles. I believe in it. I say the creed and I believe every word. That doesn't mean that I can't embrace equal marriage. Part of the problem here is liberal Christians who accept equal marriage sometimes assume that means they have to be very fluid on their, on their belief in the truth of Scripture. Well, I reject that. I do, I, I do not think the, the, these things are mutually exclusive. You can be uh, a very orthodox believing Christian and because of that, embrace equal marriage. No contradiction. And that's where you are. Very much where I am, yeah. I do wonder who this book is aimed at, because uh, I'll just share a couple of numbers here. This is an April 2016 Enveronics survey. Found that 80% of Canadians think gays should be generally accepted by society. But then if you poll among Muslims, 36%. Mm. Does that not suggest that Christians actually are not your problem, Michael? <laughs> that, that others are? As a Christian, uh, I, I have a, a vocation to speak out to my community, and the Roman Catholic Church is huge, and it still rejects, I think, gay dignity and gay equality and certainly gay marriage. Mm -hmm. The Anglican Church hasn't come around completely, but the elephant in the room, the issue of Islam, the Islamic diaspora uh, in Europe and North America and elsewhere, yes, the attitudes there are changing very slowly. And there's also the, the generational problem of some younger Muslims are in many ways more conservative than their parents. But I'm not qualified to discuss that. I don't know the community well enough. I mean, certainly within the Islamic world itself, in, in the Middle East and elsewhere in Pakistan, these issues are simply not discussed or debated. Uh, but as I say, I, I'm not qualified to write that. Look, I'm, it's bad enough dealing with the hate mail for this one. I mean, <laughs> give, give me a chance, Steve. <laughs> well, let me pick up on that, because uh, you, you alluded to this a couple of minutes ago. Some people think that this is an opportunistic play by you, that you have wanted to kind of appeal to a more liberal mainstream audience in yeah. hopes of uh, presumably making more money. Yeah, it's all What's about happened money. to your financial bottom line of your household as a result <laughs> of coming out with this kind of a, a well, book? My wife's working at Starbucks, but <laughs> no, actually she really is, but she loves it. Um, we own our house. We have savings. I'm not desperate, but, and I'm not going to play a martyr here because I've seen what gay people have had to go through, particularly in other countries. Um, but it was pretty weird when people were saying, he's doing this for money. I lost quite a bit. Uh, I lost a TV gig at Huntley Street. I mean, I, I have the email so I can say this on TV. It's in the book. You know, they severed all links with me because of my views on this. How many years were you there? Well, I hosted a, a show there for 12 years and then left. And when Sun News ended, they asked me to go back as a guest host. And, mm -hmm. and th that hurt me because if they would have said, don't talk about the issue on air, I would have said, of course, you know, I wouldn't do that. But it was just, no, you're gone. Columns? Um, well, when I left the, 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 the Catholic Church as a result of this, I lost, yeah, I lost three columns there. Speaking gigs? Oh, every one. Every one? Every single one. I, I, I was speaking every two weeks throughout North America. Every one just went just like that. Book sales? Um, well, all the Catholic books, they were still selling very well. It, I had, even had people sending them back to me, which was great, because then I went and sold them at a second-hand store. <laughs> but no, they all, I mean, all of that. Uh, people really sent the books back to yeah, you? Yeah, a few people. I, I lost half my income. Huh. But, that, but, but I want to emphasize that isn't the issue. Um, mm. I, I gained so much more. I, I gained the friendship of so many people and just within me, selfishly, my faith has never been deeper and I've never felt more content in me. Have people who in the past thought you were an intolerant jerk for writing what you wrote, mm. um, have any of them come to you and I'm not sure what the right word is here, ha have they forgiven you, have they embraced you, have they any of the above? Oh, beyond numbers. And now there are some people who won't forgive, and, and I, that's up to them. Uh, I understand that to a certain degree, but I can't, I don't have the time to deal with that. It has been genuinely moving, the number of people who, in the gay community and elsewhere who've come to me, um, and I've just been so warm and forgiving. I, I, I spoke at Metropolitan Community Church, the Church of Brent Hawkes. Um, he was a good man, a Should very good man. Take 30 seconds to explain what that is for people who live of course. outside Toronto. Uh, Metropolitan Community Church is, I suppose, the gay church. I mean, it's not exclusively gay, uh, but its charism, its center point, will be for the gay community. You've been, you've been excluded from so many others. And Brent Hawkes is a wonderful man um, who is the lead minister there. And I spoke, and it was I, was... I was leaving my home where the emails were just over and over again, you're this, you're that, you're horrible, you're vile, you're doing this. And I went to speak at this church with all these people I, I, who I'd criticized over the years, and I got a standing ovation and hugs and warmth. And, and even for this constipated Brit like me, I went home that night and I cried. It was absolutely lovely. And all sorts of people have, uh, you know, just the other day, I spoke at Glad Day Books, the gay bookshop in Toronto, and it's just so, so loving. I mean, it, it, it's taught me 
Some of the best Christians I've ever met in the past two years have been gay Christians because they've stayed in churches, even though they know people might be nice, but they're not really wanted. And they're told, it's fine, you're gay, as long as you don't do anything about it, then we'll accept you. Or they've been just thrown out of their families, I mean, varying degrees of, of discrimination. And they've stayed faithful to their relationship with God. Some of the finest Christians I've ever met have been gay Christians. Surprise you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I've had a lot of wonderful surprises. He's a god of surprises. I've had a lot of surprises in the past two years. Yeah. Uh, one thing that is not a surprise is that you've written another really good book. Well, thank you. Because you do that all the time. Thanks. Michael Corrin, Epiphany, A Christian's Change of Heart and Mind Over Same-Sex Marriage. Great to have you on TV. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.